It is such a joy to be able to be in the house of God and to be able to worship with you, to be able to praise his name, to lift up the name of Jesus. And you may be saying, why is it the stand solo? I'm going to use a, a, a chair, which I commonly don't use. But I am going to be preaching today. I'm going to be teaching. And I want to make sure that I am laser focused. I don't want to deviate. I want to make sure that I don't speak what I think. I don't want to speak anything that is not of the Word of God. And before I go into delve into the sermon this morning, uh, on your way out, we have this little book. Does anybody, anybody recognize this little book? It's called Our Daily Bread. I grew up in a different country. You know that I grew up in a different place of the world. And I grew up with this little booklet. And what it does, it has... It has a Bible portion, it has a, a devotional, a little story that you can read on a daily basis. Doing a devotional is something that you do every day. You don't, you don't, do you, do you all eat every day or do you just skip days when you eat? Right? We all eat every day. Some of us eat two times a day, some of us eat three times a day. Feeding your natural body is something you do consistently to keep it healthy, right? Your spiritual being is exactly the same. It needs the Word of God. And this is, you know, coincidentally called Our Daily Bread. There's many issues out there. You can have them. They're absolutely free. We brought some. I, I'm, I'm hoping that you take one. And if you haven't begun your, your uh, devotional life, this is a good day to start. It actually starts in September, but it's a good way to start. Number two, I want you to be intentional about this. Your mom, can you have this one more time? I want you to, and I'm going to ask the ushers, I didn't ask them before. I want you to take these cards. We have plenty of cards, Chris. Uh, if you can take them out and put them in the table, why do I want you to take one of these cards? You never know when you are going to come across someone that you need to invite to church. And what these cards have, they have a, a picture of our pastor. They have a little note about what we do. It, it they, they gives the the social media instructions, our phone number, our address, and it says a family, a home for you. What do I want you to do? I want you to take this with you. And if you know somebody that the Holy Spirit is prompting you to connect with them because you sense that they have a need, all you have to do, hey, I would love to see you here, and you hand him out to church. Chris, I'm going to give it to you. No, literally. Okay. <laughs> hey, hey, you know what, bro? Look, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me make my spiel. I, I, I don't know what's going on, but I, I, I sense that I want to invite you to my church. There's a lot of things that I think is going to be good for you. Here's our address. Look, I want to see you next time. Right? And I do. That's great. That's it. That's all you have to do. Is that simple? Yes. Keep, keep it simple. Don't make it complicated. People are tired of complicated. We all want simple, right? So, on that premise... I am going to preach this morning. Y'all know what happened on Friday, June 24th. Anybody doesn't know what happened? For over 50 years, the law of the land was that a woman had the right to have an abortion. And this is a very, this is a very delicate matter. And today, I, I come to you with my arms telling you we love you but I need to preach the word of God. And there is a contradicting message out in the world right now. And this morning, I am going to preach not my opinion. I am going to preach exactly what the word of God says. But let me read to you really quickly what happened, just in case you didn't know what happened. In, the, this, in, in 1973, there was a vote that in the Supreme Court of the United States of America called, called Roe versus Wade concluded that a child who has not yet been born, was not a human being nor any person, so he could not be protected by the right to life that is assured to the persons, by the Constitution of the United States of America. The Supreme Court concluded then that an unborn fetus is only part of its mother's body and not a separate individual. We are living in a time in the world where everything that you see around you is against what is predicated on the Word of God. My friends, my fellow believers, we need to be completely certain 
of what we believe and the principles of God that will determine what we do, not only as individuals, but as a family and as a nation. The topic this, this morning, it is called What the Bible Says About Abortion. For over 50 years, do you mind that I, if I sit, is it, is it okay with you? I, it's, it's, <laughs> okay, thank you. I, I, I wasn't going to stand up anyway, but I, I still wanted to. <laughs> For over 50 years, we've been praying that something happens, that something changes. And my God, I am seeing so many young people in this church. I'm seeing so many young people, not too many here, but definitely over there and definitely over here. We love you, but we want you to stand in the word. There's a lot of pressure out in the world which, which is in direct opposition to what God says. What does the Bible say about abortion? It matters. It matters because there's going to be a personal opinion that you want to have, and necessarily it may not be your opinion, but you are influenced and, and pressured to believe what is against the word of God. Let me give you this analogy, a really cool story about about what happened. There's a professor at a world-renowned medical school presented to students this medical scenario. Here's a story, said the, said the professor uh, of the family. The father is sick uh, with an infection, continuously gets infections. The mother has tuberculosis. Together, they already have four children. The first of them is blind. The second child has already died. The third child is deaf. And the fourth one has tuberculosis. Now, the mother is pregnant again. The parents have come to see you for advice. They are willing to have an abortion if that is exactly what you suggest. Remember, this is a, a group of people that are medical students, and this scenario is being presented to them. They will accept an abortion if you tell them that is what's recommended. What would you suggest, said the professor? Each one of the students gave their view, their personal perspective, but then the teacher asked them to separate into different groups so they can consult as a group. After a while, all the groups came back and concluded that they would recommend, in this case, an abortion. The professor said, well, congratulations. You just took the life of Ludwig van Beethoven. This was published in a, in a column by Ann Landis many years ago. But the reality is, that we are living in difficult times. And what happened on Thursday, and on Friday, it changes the tide as a nation. My concern, young people, middle-aged people, and a little bit older folks like me, is that we become a nation that fears God, that understands that God has principles and promises for people to stand by his word. Psalms 100, verses 1 through 5 says, and just so you know, there is no outline this morning. I want you to pay close attention. If you want to, you can watch the sermon. I, I already told the media team, if there's one sermon that we need to upload, is this one. So you can review it and, and, and break it down and, and read every scripture and, and quote every reference and, and, and look it up because this is important. It really matters. Psalms 100, 1 through 5, it says, Shout joyfully, joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with jubilation. Come before him with rejoicing. Know, know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts us with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his faithfulness is to all generations. Many have said, concluded, or think that the Bible does not say anything about the sanctity of life, about how sacred your life and my life is. But there is nothing that could be further from the truth because the Bible is overflowing with stories, with teachings, with portions of it that conclude that God loves human beings so much that he sent his son. And where's the cross? Somewhere. Is there a cross here? Do we take it out? Okay, <laughs> that's fine. 
that his son Jesus Christ came to die for us on a cross. That's how much God loves human life. God's word is conclusive on its position when it comes to the destruction of human life at any stage. When we read that commandment, and you know that commandment, thou shalt not kill, right? We've all seen the movie. We've all read the Ten Commandments. There's one that specifically says, you cannot kill. That commandment applies not only to human beings that are mature, to teenagers, to young people, to babies, but also to those that have not been born as of yet. There's many questions that come up when we talk about this matter. A lot of you may be questioning yourselves, where do we stand? Where do I need to stand? Can I give you, can I give you an answer to your question? Where do you need to stand this morning? You need to stand right here, my friends. This is where we need to stand. Let me tell you, if you are not standing on the word of God, and now you're bringing your grandchildren for the first time. They're saying, who is this guy? He's crazy, right? I am. But our world is shaking and crumbling when we don't stand upon the word of God. That is my rock. This is exactly where I need to be standing when the storms of life come roaring against my life, against my family, against my marriage, trying to take away my children, trying to take away the innocent lives of unborn babies. This is where we need to stand. So I know you have questions this morning. We're going to focus on six questions that I will propose to you this morning. And what we want to do is we want to have a dialogue, a dialogue based on the word of God. And please, my friends, don't clam up this morning. Don't shut down and say, well, that is your perspective. This is my perspective. Please hear me out. I implore to you, have an open mind. And let's believe, because it is so, that the Lord Jesus is in this place teaching us as if we were sitting at his feet. And I'm not being pretentious. Believe me, I am not. I am, I am flawed just like you. If not, ask that woman that is sitting right there. That's my wife for the last 28 and a half years. I am flawed. My daughter is here. I'm not perfect. But I do preach the teachings of one, of the one who is perfect. That's how I want you to receive the word this morning. There are questions we will consider. The first one, when, when does life begin? The Bible says in Genesis 2, 7, and the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Human life begins the moment a man is conceived. And just like when Adam was in that dust from the ground and God breathed his breath of life into him, he became a living being. And every one of his offspring, God gave him a reproductive uh, system. So every, all of you are human beings, descendants of Adam. All of us, all of us, every single one of you is made in the image of God. Let me tell you this morning. Why does the devil hate you? The devil hates you because he sees the image of God in you. He cannot stand it. And he cannot, st he, he stands it even less when you voluntarily decide to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you lift up your hands and you say nothing else, he absolutely cannot stand it when you and I worship the one and only true living God. Because we are made in God's image. Generation after generation that has roamed the face of the earth still carries the image of God, whether you are 70 years old or you are developing in your mother's womb. The second question that I will propose to you this morning, and we want you, I want you to think about this. Is the unborn child, is the unborn child a human being? Think about it. Ponder that thought for just a few seconds. Is that, is that unborn child a human being? And I know that I have people that are educated in this sanctuary this morning. Webster's Dictionary says this, human. The entry for the word human, it says, having human form or attributes. 
and the word being, because we are human beings after all, right? Is anybody here not a human being? Look around. I know you may think that the, the guy's not a human being. That we all are human beings, right? But the word being, the definition, it is the quality or state of having existence. So a being is something that exists. Now, can anyone then rationally conclude that an unborn baby is not a human being? To believe that that baby is not a being is to believe that that baby does not exist. When that fetus, that embryo, is and I, I took the time to study and look at pictures at different developmental stages of that baby, and goodness, at a very early stage, it looks like a human being. At a very early stage, it looks like a little head and a little mouth, and some of you guys have bigger mouths, but you know, it, 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 looks, it looks like a little tiny little thing. But that human being is something that exists. It is a human being, right? And to believe that it is not a human being, then there must be an assumption that it is something else. You cannot disprove that when a baby or that embryo, if you want to call it that, is developing in the mother's womb, it is something that is existing. It is a human being in development. Now, if it is a being, and we conclude that it's human, it has to be human. It is nothing else. I don't know that any other human being starts being a pig or a dog or a cat in their mother's womb. It is a human being from the beginning. And let me read you this that is in my notes. I make sure that I need to read it to you. We are sure then that this developing child within the mother's womb from the moment of conception is a human being with all its potential. It's right there in this screen. Every time that we take away the life of an unborn child, we are taking the life of a human being that God designed with a purpose in mind. The room is quiet. They need to pay your attention. The third question I want you to consider is the unborn, unborn child a person? Because you may say, well, that's not a person. It is just a, hu a, 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 a human being, a little body. Is that a person? Let me not answer this question. Let's see what the Word of God says. Psalms 139, 13 through 16. It says, you created every part of me. You put me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because you are to be feared. All you do is strange and wonderful. Do you ever feel like this? That what God does is strange, but it's wonderful? Has he ever done something that is strange in your life, but it is wonderful? The fact alone that you are here right now, we are strange, but we are wonderful. I know it with all my heart. When my bones were being formed, carefully put together in my mother's womb, when I was growing there in secret, you knew that I was there. You saw me. You saw me before I was born. The days allotted to me had all been recorded in your book before any of them ever began. Uh, what I did as an exercise in my notes, I highlighted and I emboldened every one of the of this of the pronouns. I say, I, I, am I saying that right? Clutch. Thank you. I have a big old forehead. Don't it? It's, shy, it's really shiny, isn't it? Especially when I sweat. Thirteen times, Bridget. It says me, my. Talking about being developed in his mother's womb. Little Victoria, being shaped by God. He didn't know she was going to have little blue eyes or green eyes. She was going to be more than me, tell where he said. He didn't know. God did. When we make this personal, it changes the context of everything. I have my own blanket that she's sitting over there. God knew you 
Can I tell you that, church? Can we tell the world that? That every one of those women has a purpose and there's a time. I am going to apologize on behalf of many preachers who have been hateful about this, who have not shared the good news with love, taking the life of the innocent. It is not viewed okay or accepted by a loving God, by a loving God. Just as you, who are parents, view it unacceptable that somebody would take your life and you were killed. Am I right? It is not acceptable. Every time that David mentions his 13 pronouns, he is making reference to himself as a person with a purpose and a promise. Not only David, but look at what Jeremiah writes. And he pens down. He's a prophet inspired by God. And this is what God tells him in Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. Can I give you one more example? Remember Elizabeth going to see Mary? Elizabeth was the mother of John the Baptist. She was a cousin to Mary, the mother of Jesus. The Bible takes this story. Let me read it to you right out of the word of God. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to see me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Could there be any more conclusive proof that a baby inside leaps and jumps and feels and knows? I remember, I, and I'm going to reference my children because I wasn't there when you, when, you know, when you had your children, but I remember my wife, me coming from work every night at 11 o'clock at night, my, my wife told me, Gina is waiting for you because we knew we were going to have a girl. And every night when I walked into that little one-bedroom apartment at Valentine Street in El Cajon, California, that I would come at 11.30 at night and I would put my hands on my wife's little belly because she had a little belly, and the baby would just start kicking. At 11.30 at night, every night, that baby inside a womb is a person. It's not, it's not an object. It's not a part of the woman's body. I know, ladies, it, it, it is inside of a body, and, and I'm, I'm not a doctor, but that baby has an identity, has a purpose. In fact, the word, the Greek word in this passage, baby, is the word brethos. This word is the same word that appears in this passage that refers to the, the, the child in the womb Elizabeth. And if we read from a Greek lexicon by Thayer, it says that word refers to an unborn child, an embryo, or a seed. We need to understand. Let's consider this for a moment. It is interesting to note that when someone is planning to end the life of a baby, to be born, and destroy the miracle of, of God, of a newborn life, they never refer to that baby as a baby, but they call it rather a fetus or an embryo. Think about the last, the, the, the words are very important. People don't realize how powerful, how powerful words are. When people decide to have an abortion, they don't call, I'm going to go kill my baby. I'm going to get rid of this baby. Say, I'm going to get rid of this fetus or this embryo. But on the other hand, on the flip side, if you plan to have a baby, and I know we had four and we had little you know, baby showers and fiestas, because we're Mexican, we have big old parties, right? We never said, hey, you know what? I am going to make this party for my fetus or for my embryo, <laughs> right? You don't say that. I'm going to do this for my baby. I'm going to do this for my child. See, we have to respect that every unborn child, it is a person and it is affected by the circumstances that we are experiencing. The fourth question I want you to think about is the unborn baby a soul? Does that little baby inside the womb have a soul? 
The Bible tells us, and it's not on the screen, this I looked it up on my own. In Ephesians 2.10, it says that we are God's workmanship. We are God's workmanship. And I'm not saying it in Spanish because you know that I, my language is my original language. And in Spanish, the word is somos hechura suya. And when that word, is, I'm going to try to then bounce back to English. When, we are, when it says right there that we are God's workmanship, it says that we are like made by God. Like when you, when you make something carefully, that's how God makes it. And when God made you, listen, God made you, God made your spirit, God made your soul, and God made your body. And if you don't believe me, look at what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, okay? It says, now may the, and it's not in the screen, but I'm going to read it to you. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept complete blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God. God, my friends, has bestowed human beings the honor that he did not confer to anything else in creation. We have a soul. And that soul was given to God, to us by God at the moment of conception. For that reason alone, human life that is ended at any other time, it has lost its value that it has in soul. Now, is abortion because we're going to get here into the, into the difficult thing. Is abortion ever justified? God's commandment, thou shalt not kill, emphasizes, like we stated earlier, the importance of human life. However, listen, however, the Bible makes a clear distinction between the shedding of innocent blood versus killing as a due consequence of a crime. The Bible, not me, the Bible does make punishable by death some serious crimes in the Old Testament, such as murder, rape, incest, and child sacrifice. But God, all throughout the Bible, opposes the death of the innocent. There is no example in Scripture where the Bible teaches or that God condemns the death of an unborn child. You will not find it in the Bible. God does not condone taking away the life of an innocent child. Most Christians have concluded, listen, because I know the argument is out there. Even in it's perhaps prevalent in our Christian circles that it is okay then when the mother's life is at risk to have an abortion, and then therefore it is justified. But we have to also be understanding that there are so many technological advances in the medical field nowadays that a mother's life can be rescued in most cases. We have to understand that there, you were sharing it this morning, sister, I, I can't say the details, but you were saying something that is very personal that applies to this point. When, when science says, no, it, it, it's not going to happen, God has a plan. God has a purpose. Sometimes, sometimes we get in the way of God performing a miracle in the lives of many people. Now, there's another, there's another argument. Well, is rape or incest a reason that justifies it? The numbers and the evidence shows us that no more than 1% of abortions that happen are for the innocent. But let's dialogue a little bit more. Let's dig a little deeper. Let's, let's, let's change the pace and see where else we can find about this. Can I ask you this question? Does destroying an unborn child eliminate the tragedy of a rape? I am not saying, and women, we love you. And I understand that that word is, it's tragic. I will never undermine how tragic that can be for a woman. The, the, the trauma that it can, that it can cause. 
So let's have an honest conversation. Does taking the life of an unborn child in sight of the mother make it any better? It doesn't. I like to say that doing that, an act of violence against a mother, justify an act of violence against an unborn child. I want to say that if you have commit that tragedy, tragedy of taking the, away that life of the child, it only increments it. It, it. it makes it even worse for the for the woman that has suffered this harm. Deuteronomy twenty two twenty five says, but if out in the country a man happens to meet a young woman pledged to be married and rapes her, only the man who has done this shall die. And in Deuteronomy twenty four sixteen it says, parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sin. We talked about the technological changes, the medical field, but what about the scenario when there's a child that has an abnormality, a disease, right? We, we fall back into what I just said. You just never know what God is going to do. I know of parents that have had a child with Down syndrome. And, and that child, they had the chance to abort that child because they had Down syndrome. But they decided not to. They decided to honor God and God's word. And that child has become the greater blessing in their life. You just never know. You just never know what's going to happen. And the sixth question that I will conclude this morning is this. What, as Christians, what can we do? What can we do as believers? Look at me for one second. We could have stood on the sidelines and said nothing about this. We could have continued with the sermon that was part of the sermon series, but... It, we decided, my pastor decided, and I spent a great deal of my day yesterday with him. We've been talking, we, we spent, uh, we did a lot of things together. We, we cannot be spectators. The church cannot stand on the sidelines and say, well, it is what it is. We need to do something about it. So everything that I've told you this morning, it's not so you can just think about it, we need to do something about it. What can we do as Christians to stop, to stop the killing of so many unborn child? Number one, we need to preach and teach and proclaim the sacredness and the sanctity of all human life, both born and unborn. And those lights are driving people crazy. Not me, I'm fine, I'm just preaching. There you go. We need to continue. And if we haven't done so emphatically, we need to continue to preach, teach, and proclaim the sacredness and the sanctity of all human life, born and unborn. Number two, we need to support the, and you say, Pastor, you're getting all political. Let's listen. How can I say this with love? I need to be careful who I support and who I endorse. I need to be careful. As Christians, we need to be careful who we support or who we endorse. And I encourage you this morning to support the efforts of those seeking a constitutional amendment to prohibit abortion. In California, you know that after this law was taken down on a federal, in a federal way, right? Each state still has its own laws. California, being one of the most liberal states in that regard, has concluded that they're not only going to continue, but they're going to promote and even build some cities that are going to be refuges to continue the practice of abortion. I cannot tell you how to think, but I can tell you what the Word of God says. I think I've pled my case and I think I've managed to tell you exactly where we stand as a church, where we stand as people of God. But I do tell you this morning that we need to support things that prohibit abortion. We need to pray. 
We need to pray for our state. We need to pray for our families. Number three, we need to support candidates for office who will work for legislation and a human life amendment. Am I telling you you need to vote this color or vote that color? No, I'm not telling you that. But you support people that value life. You support people that value what you believe in. Is this being political about it? I believe that more than being political, it's being spiritual. And we know that a country under the fear of God will always flourish and prosper. I can guarantee you that. Number four, we need to oppose. What can we do as Christians? Well, we can oppose the use of federal, state, and local tax money to fund abortion. There was a, a, a and I know I'm, you've been very patient, but there was a woman with a sign that said, we want abortion, we just don't want people. We don't want people. That's the problem. We don't want Jesus. We need Jesus. We need to oppose the giving of federal, state, and local tax money to organizations that perform or, or promote abortion. And six, preach and teach and proclaim biblical instruction regarding proper sexual relationships. And I know there's children in the room but a pregnancy happens a lot of the times because people are doing things that shouldn't be doing. As of 2002, 79% of the abortions carried out in the U.S. of A. were of single or women that were not pregnant. 79%. Somewhere along the lines, there's a lack of teaching on how to respect and how to not do certain things that will get you pregnant. Okay, number seven, and this is where I'm going to be. Julio, can you come up, please? We need to minister and counsel with godly compassion to the unwed mother. I think this is where we need to focus a lot of us. I te cuido con la sangre de Cristo. But if I had a daughter that became pregnant, a lot of people they just kick the girl. Get out of here. You're ashamed of my name. When instead, we should be ministering and counseling with godly compassion to the unborn. It happens. It happens. Abortion, like any other thing, is forgiven. Forgiven. If you're a woman that committed and had an abortion, there is grace for you. There is love for you. There's forgiveness. There's compassion. We accept it. My past is my past. It's nobody's business. My past has been canceled. My debt has been But we need to emphasize that and not be critical, judgmental, and single out people that have committed that abortion. Number eight, it continues along the same line. Minister with compassion to those who have participated in abortion, pointing them to the grace and forgiveness of a loving God. This is what I want you to do. When you walk out of this room, I want you to be full with the love of God and the grace of God. I I praise the name of Jesus for what happened. But don't think this war is over. It is only beginning. There's now more than ever. We need to be on our knees and praying that God will change the tide of this nation. And it changes by changing our states, our cities, by making sure that we are bold and that our children know exactly where we stand. I've had this conversation with my children. I've told them exactly where I stand. We should be Amen. Let me, let me finish out with this one verse that I want to read. Me saying, Pastor, I don't know if I like what you said. 
I have my own thoughts. Let me read. Let me read to you what David said in the same psalm that we read just a little bit ago, Psalm 139. And it says this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And I love this portion. It says, point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. We love you. But let the Holy Spirit teach you and to nail down what I what I shared with you. Let us bow our heads and let us pray. Father, I thank you for the sanctity of life. And I thank you that we've made a step forward in this nation to protect millions of unborn babies that were made in the image of God. I pray that you, Holy Spirit, will come and search the heart of everyone of my fellow brothers and sisters. And if there's any doubt, if there's anything that is making them uncomfortable or uneasy, you do the work of convincing and convicting every one of us that we are enlightened by the truth, that we are enlightened by your word, and that we would walk in the way of the everlasting. I bless every family in this room. In Jesus' name. Anthony, Anthony is going to do... Uh, Christian's offering, and after that, we are going to do. Thank you, Lord.